It's easy to be living in a modern era and look back and laugh at older generations for their customs and traditions, but none is arguably more laughable than the medieval ages. It's an era known for its rampant poverty, disease, and overall poor quality of life. However, this dull way of living did lead to some of the most eccentric and downright comedic decisions to date. Today in our top 10, we'll be covering the most unusual events from medieval history. Beaver Porcupine Swan, what could be inhabiting your local conservation center could also be inhabiting the menu served at a royal medieval dining table. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig. Because... Why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass. But he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espitola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid. And flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, Time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said. So let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number seven in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law. And so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages 
ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread, and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex, and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th, and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. For number 5, we're getting a little spicy with Risqué's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era? It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in a historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought, and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now, there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death, even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his 
hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is Trials of the Dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Famorpheus, the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to usurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Famorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene, or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691 a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned, making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. So thank you so much for watching, that's all we have today in our top 10 countdown of unusual medieval events. Comment down below what you think the most unusual event was and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe if you'd like to see more from us. Until next time.